Okay, so we come to that time. We're going to hear uh, the Word of God preached. And I uh, just want to read from Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14, before Chris comes and speaks to us. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, the much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. And I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 Thank you, Helena. We've got some uh, really good readers in church, and thank you to everyone who reads the Word of God. Absolutely amazing. And so there's going to be a PowerPoint. I've done quite a few um, pictures today. It's just the way that it all flowed, just the way it all worked out. And um, you've gathered that today I want to talk about the sin of presumption. But I will come back to the psalm in another sermon because this psalm is absolutely amazing. It's got so much in it. But today I wanted to focus, particularly as we were doing communion, and I just felt led uh, to go to the uh, Book of Common Prayer and to actually expand upon this. And actually, this has come from Sheila's sermon last week. She preached a, such a powerful word. And she mentioned that many in the worldwide church today operate out of presumption rather than out of true faith. Do you remember saying that, Sheila? And I was sitting there, and, and the way she put it, it just, it just sort of hit me, and it, it really did challenge me, and it, it, it challenged me to think about my own life. And it's good to be challenged in church, isn't it? I mean, we come and, and we, we rejoice, we sing, we, we, we meditate on the Word of God, we, and we are challenged by God, and all of it is really, really good. And um, we have experienced communion in a slightly different way, not as long as the Book of Common Prayer uh, would do it, but the Book of Common Prayer was written in 1549. It was revised extensively in 1552 and again in 6062. The words that we spoke are very old and they are ancient. And I hope that as you read those words, you had a deep realization of God's grace, that we have no merit, we are saved by the grace of God alone, through our faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. And we said, we do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. And that's expressed in the communion table. So what is presuming? What is presumption? And is it ever right and biblical to presume on God? Well, presumption at its core involves making assumptions or taking liberties without sufficient evidence or without sufficient understanding. And when it comes to the Bible, especially without biblical permission, we can presume that the Bible is saying something that we want it to say, but actually, when we delve in really deep, it isn't saying what we want to say, 
And we are challenged to bring our lives and our thoughts and our beliefs in line with God's word. Scripture cautions us against being presumptuous, both in actions and in thoughts. Proverbs 21.7, it's on our screen, reminds us, do not boast about tomorrow. Do not be presumptuous about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. It's a wise saying, isn't it? And scripture tells us, you know, God is wisdom. Jesus Christ is wisdom of God. And Proverbs 3, 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Do not be presumptuous about your own understanding and apply that upwards to God. We need to hear from God and apply his word down here in us. So what is presumption? Well, first, presumption is an idea that is taken to be true on the basis of probability or guesswork. Um, And we make a guess, and we might make a guess because things have worked out in the past, or we've thought something in the past and it seems to be good for today. And I have to say that, for those who know me, my logical male personality and character, my very quick thinking mind, that tries to work out all the what-if scenarios has a huge weakness. It can lead me into the sin of presumption, i.e. guessing what might happen or guessing uh, the future. And I make a guess, I I do it with what I think is a good motive, I do it out of logic, I, I assess the probabilities. And a simple example, okay, because I've had quite a week this week, Um, I think the Lord has taken me through a week to teach me, Chris, do not be presumptuous. And uh, little did I know when Sheila said that word, the sort of week that I was going to have. But you know that quite often I'll go to Rocky's and, and I go to Rocky's barn, it's nice and quiet. There is always parking around Rocky's. I've been there many times and there's always parking and that's one reason why I go there. So, in writing this sermon about the sin of presumption, guess what? I go to think about it and research it at Rockies, and I presumed, as usual, there would be car parking. Was there? No, there was not. I was wrong. I went up and down the street. I even went up a one-way street. I then had to do a 10-point turn. I got boxed in. And I ended up parking over the road at a supermarket. Never in my life have I had to do that before. And I'm reminded that God is good all the time. That is a fact. God is good all the time to his kids. But my personal experience, it felt like my heavenly father was teaching me something practically about presumption. How many times have you and I expected God to give us a car parking space? Oh, Lord, if please only give me that. And my day will go really, really well. And then when we get a car parking space, we say, hallelujah, Lord. And when we don't, oh, God, you didn't provide me. You know, you know what it's like. Presumption is not just an attitude of heart and mind and thinking, but it does come out in our behavior. So here's a good example of presumption. You will know about this if you watch the news. It's perceived as being arrogant or disrespectful and transgressing or going over the lines or the limits of what is permitted or appropriate. For example, and this was an example, a dictionary example, and it says this in the dictionary. He lifted her off the ground and she was enraged at his presumption. We know all about that with the Spanish coach, don't we? And the women's football team. If Christians presume, presume that people should always be healed, always healthy, always wealthy, if they have no doctrine of suffering, then their presumption can fall into commanding that the sick be healed, even without asking the sick person if they want prayer, and even not asking God whether it's his will or his time. We can presume so many things and it comes out in our actions. And Sheila last week made the brilliant point that the sin of presumption can masquerade itself as true biblical faith. 
And we need to be careful how we behave and how we operate. Now, before I got into my car with the car parking space problem, I like to go to Rockies on my bike. I've got a cheap electric bike. I got on it 400 meters down the road. I see glass strewn all over the place. I swerved to avoid it. I missed most of it. But yes, what happened? I got, a, I got a puncture. Can you believe it? I'm excited about going and researching and putting together the sermon. And now all of a sudden, poo. Can I say that? I've got a puncture. Oh, Lord. Why me? Just when I'm looking forward to writing this sermon about presumption, I have a puncture. You could have helped me to avoid it. You should have helped me. After all, you are my Father in heaven. <coughs> Do you know, when we're stressed, that sort of attitude can actually come out. We, we might be brave enough to speak it verbally, but I'm sure some of us think it or we ponder it in our hearts. Oops, presumption. Not that God is my Father in heaven, because that is a fact. God is my Father in heaven. It's true because I am in Christ. So that's not presumption. But presumption is presuming that God should prevent anything bad happening to me, and that God should prevent it all the time. Helena knows me uh, more than most, and this, I think, as I'm preaching this sermon, has got to be one of the biggest sins that I actually have. Do you know, when we become a Christian, and how we are birthed, how we are born, and, 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 and the environment in which we come into the faith, it can raise our expectations, can't it? And so all of a sudden, we project what we think we see happening onto God. I've become a Christian, everything should go really well. I've become a Christian, I should be a millionaire. I should never have a bad back or a bad hip or another hip or a bad hand. Everything should go hunky-dory. And when it doesn't, it can lead to huge disappointment and frustration can build within us. I said earlier, if we don't have the right doctrines of what life is truly about, the biggest sickness that any of us face is death. It is. So, um, you know, we're all sick and we're all marching towards the biggest sickness. And so God doesn't heal everybody all the time. Although for a person in Christ Jesus, we are healed spiritually. We will have a perfect body when the time comes. We just have to live in a fallen world and be mature, sensible people and actually have a mature faith that can withstand the pressures of what happened in life and we must not presume that God should do it my way because God will only do it his way. And as we said, Sheila made the point, presumption can masquerade itself as true biblical um, uh, faith. How many times have I presumed that God should do things for me because now I'm a Christian? It's presumption. And even if I go to scripture and I try to work out a particular formula, if I do this in this way and I say it in that way, then God has to do it. That is presumption. That is presumption. We cannot take scripture, the Bible, and turn it into a formula to make God act for us. It does not work that way. God is not bound to do anything. So I have to say, God did not help me, either with the parking. God did not help me uh, because I got a puncture. But maybe God helped me because yesterday I fixed the puncture. Hallelujah. And I hope my tire is nice and solid when I go home today. But my bike puncture is why I went in my car, as I told you. But despite the parking problem, as I'm going around the corner to get to the place where I'm going to think and meditate on God's word, bang. Somehow, my front wheel went up the curb. How did that happen? And it was quickly followed by my back, my back wheel went up the curb. How did that happen? God, why didn't you stop me hitting and going up the curb? Why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? But I do not presume, Lord, that you should step in and stop all of my mistakes. You're not my sugar daddy, but you do allow stuff to happen to teach adult lessons. 
and I did realize uh, this is a week of adult lessons about presumption. A lock went in a house. Cost me a lot of money to get a locksmith out on a Sunday night. And then I managed to fix the lock myself for 10% of what I was charged. It was the beginning of my week, I tell you. As I'm thinking about presumption, I thank Sheila for her word. Not blaming you, Sheila. But it started that very Sunday night. The sin of presumption, it's so easy for us and so easy for me to kind of fall into it because I, in a way, I'm expecting my father to do all these things. See, as you know, my own dad left me when I was seven. So I've not had a human father in the way that maybe a lot of you have had. I've not had the discipline of, of a human father. I, I'm not quite sure what it should feel like. And, uh, and I think that's why I'm a little wayward. I think that's why I'm a little, I'm a little sporadic. Um, but there's some good, good things about being sporadic. It has made me quite a real person and sharing in a real, uh, real way with my faith. But you know, sometimes presumption can actually be correct, okay? I presumed that the Salt Church ladies would be at Rockies. They usually are on the day that I was going. They usually are on the day that I was going. What do you think? Were they there or weren't they there? Yes, they were there. But I can tell by looking out over you that some of you thought, well, the week Chris is having, no, they weren't there. <laughs> but actually, you made a presumption that they weren't there. They actually were there. Amen. And what a beautiful group of people they are. And um, we drank lots of coffee and we had some good laughs. And I've included them in this sermon with their permission, of course. Psalm 19.13 says this. Also, keep, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great trans transgression. There's something about a presumption stepping in for God when we have no permission to do that that actually leads to, as the psalmist says, a great transgression. Presumption, assuming an action is true or permissible without biblical warrant or guarantee. And to drive this home, consider a few examples from Scripture. Here is Adab and Abihu. I hope you know their story. But they assumed that God would accept their incorrectly measured incense when they offered it to God. In the Old Testament, there was a special formula for the incense, and God had prescribed it. It's a holy thing. But Adab and Abihu, they assumed that their incorrectly formulated um, uh, offering to God would be accepted by God. That was presumption. But in Leviticus 10, it says this, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Thank God we're in the new covenant that the sin of presumption does not lead to instant death as it did in the old covenant. And then we come to Uzziah. He preached on him, I think, last year. God wouldn't mind if he kept the ark from falling. He stuck out his hand to steady the ark, and he died. It says in Chronicles 13, David and all the Israelites were celebrating with their might before, the, before God, with songs and with the hearts, the lyres and tambourines, cymbals and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kidron, Uzziah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzziah and he struck him down because he put his hand on the ark. So he also died before the Lord. Uzziah presumed he was doing the Lord and King David a favor in saving the ark. But Uzziah had violated the law of God when God said, if this ark is holy, do not touch the ark or you will die. 
Uzziah forgot, thought he would step in for God. Do you know, every sin is rebellion against God, but presumption can actually supersize the sin. In Numbers, it says this. In fact, in my Bible, Numbers 15, 30 to 31, it has a title. It says, The Law Concerning Presumptuous Sin. And it says this. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, because, and, and this is the point, he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. And the key here is God has spoken. And on so many issues, God has spoken clearly and unambiguously, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, of course, as well. God's word is holy. And when we despise God's word or when we presume on God's word and we, we, we make it fit ourselves, then actually we are despising God and his word. And we do that when we don't believe his word and when we don't act upon it. I have to say, as I was thinking about a New Testament example, I, this one sends shivers down my spine. It will probably send shivers down yours as well. But it's in the Bible, and we need to talk about it. For me, the most terrifying verse is Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And it says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, <coughs> will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And similarly, in the passage that I read from, from Corinthians, ladies, you might think it doesn't apply to you. The word men, man, mankind is applying to all of us. And so all of us can actually fall into this. It's terrifying. It's a strong message. It's a warning. It is a warning to, to people who presume on the salvation of God, who presume by taking God's word and they make it into something it's not for their own gain. To give them money, faking manipulations and healings and miracles, do you know, there'll be some big surprises in heaven. In my time in ministry, I've known many people presume in this way on God's word. And you have to wonder, where are they with the Lord? We must understand, we must act upon, and we must clearly act in the way that the Bible is describing and not be presumptuous with God's word. You know, presumption can... Presumptuous sins, it cuts many ways. We can presume on the goodness of God. You know, God is good all the time. God is fantastic all the time. God's mercy and grace is fantastic and I'm healed and I'm forgiven all the time. Therefore, that means I can do whatever I want. I can live how I want. I can do what I want when I want because God's grace covers everything. There's a thing in Christianity called hypergrace, which basically says that. Hypergrace is something which says, more or less, you can kind of live how you want, God will cover it. That's not what I read in the Bible. Paul says, because of God's grace and the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ, does that mean that you can sin all the more? He says, my goodness, heavens, no. Because we are in Christ, that should motivate us to sin all the less to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, to align our lives, our thoughts, our words with God's word. It's not licentiousness. But then on the other hand, we could say that we could then turn this God's grace into legalism, into legalism. Well, I've done a lot of good works and God's fantastic. So if I carry on doing these works and if I carry on praying to God in this way, then everything will turn out okay. That's called legalism. That's working for our salvation. It's not that either. 
both licentiousness and legalism, they seek to test God. One, his goodness, we're testing his goodness so that I can sin. The other, we're testing his righteousness so that I can boast about all the good works and what a great person I am. It's so easy to fall into all of these things. And here are two characteristics of presumption compared to faith. First, presumption starts with an assumption. I keep talking to myself, Chris, do not make, do not assume. Assume you're taught in business, and I've known this for 40 years, you make an ass out of you and me. Assumption. You make an ass, which is a colt, a donkey, out of you and out of me. So presumption starts with an assumption, but faith starts with a promise. Faith starts with a promise. Here's a great quote. Those who sit on a premise, instead of standing on a promise, slip over a precipice. Did you like that? I'll say it again. Those who sit on a promise, an assumption, I'm sorry, a premise. Those who sit on a premise, instead of standing on a promise, well, they're going to slip over the precipice. Faith says, God will give us this day our daily bread. Unbelief says he won't. Doubt says he might, but presumption believes the bread must be hot and buttered. <laughs> Not your way, God, but my way. Ugh, this manna from heaven, it tastes horrible. I've got to eat this for 40 years. It's God's way, not our way. We cannot presume on God. Here's a few characters from the Bible where presumption slipped in and things happened. Abraham had true faith. He believed God's promise and he knew that he could sacrifice Isaac before Isaac had any children because God's promise, God had said, in Isaac your seed shall come. That's the promise of God. So a specific name Isaac attached to a promise. Your son Isaac, your only son, he's gonna have kids. Well, he hasn't got kids at the moment and God's telling me to sacrifice him. So Abraham stood on the promise of God and he was gonna sacrifice Isaac because he acted in faith on the true promise of God. He did not presume on God. He knew that Isaac would live even if God had to raise him from the dead. That's faith. Faith is standing on the promise of God. It's not presuming. And God had promised him and that happened. So Abraham acted in true faith, hallelujah. And of course, in Hebrews, his faith led to that great picture. Oh, Christ will die and Christ will be raised from the dead. Hallelujah. That's fantastic. Second, presumption seeks to manipulate the outcome. Do you know, I hate manipulation. Um, you know, in business, there's a lot of manipulation. I, I guess we've all got caught up in manipulation. I hate it. Until I realize, actually, I can be very manipulative myself. And, uh, and you go, oh, my goodness. I need to deal not only with presumption, but now with manipulation as well. Do you know, it's hard work being a Christian. Whoever said it's a great crutch, it isn't. It's a challenge to the core of who we are and to our behaviors. So presumption seeks to manipulate the outcome. But faith waits patiently on the Lord. Now, there are a number of examples where faith waiting patiently on the Lord didn't happen. And some of the Old Testament saints fell into the sin of presumption. So Sarah, Abraham's wife, she acted in the sin of presumption when she gave her servant girl Hagar to Abraham to bring about the promised seed. You know, God had clearly said that from Abraham and Sarah, the seed would come. Indeed, Sarah had laughed at the promise of God, not believing it. And she presumed she could bring it about with Hagar. And that led to Islam. And that led to a big war between two brothers. The child of the promise that is Isaac 
and the child of the servant girl, which was Ishmael. Thank you. Rebecca acted in the sin of presumption in deceiving Isaac to fulfill her favorite son Jacob's destiny to get the inheritance so that Jacob would become Israel. God had promised the older will serve the younger, but Rebekah and Jacob got caught up in the sin of presumption to bring the promise about by themselves, by their plans and their schemings. A form of manipulation, both of them, to bring about God's promise. Manipulation never advances God's promises. Manipulation only hinders what God is planning to do. And it can take a long time or a bit longer for God to do it because he works with us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But God doesn't need any help. God can do all these things and make his promises come about all by himself. But time after time after time, the biblical characters and ourselves, we try to manipulate it or we presume on God to make it happen in our own strength. When sometimes we just need to, I can't, I don't like patience. I really don't. Now I've got to add patience to presumption and manipulation. You know, I like things to happen. I like them to be right. Everything should work first time. When it doesn't, I get frustrated. Our Bible reading, and this will come up in another sermon, just to bring this to a close. Our Bible reading gives us a great account of who God is. Okay. We read it. Helena read it so well, and she focused on this. And, and actually, she was reading this, and I thought, you know, I'm going to have to preach on this next time I preach. It's so good. When you, when you, you know, when you actually hear it coming at you, it really makes an impression. It adds, so that's why we should always really read our Bibles out loud. We, we look at it with our eyes, we hear it in our ears, and we speak it with our mouth. We're going to get more of it, and I certainly did this morning. But this is who God is. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The statutes of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. Amen? This is who God is. I don't know if you thought like me, I, I read verse 12 and I thought, oh, who's, he, who's, who's this talking about? When, uh, when the psalmist said, you know, this is who God is, who can understand his errors? Well, initially I thought, gosh, God's got errors. I really misread it. You see, this is presuming. I read it and I thought, who can understand his errors? The psalmist is talking about God's errors. Hang on a sec. I could have presumed, but I checked myself. That can't be right. God never makes mistakes. It's impossible for God to make any mistakes. He is perfect and he is holy. And then when I read it again and I meditated on it, I, you're much wiser and more intelligent than me. You knew it wasn't about God. You knew and you read it correctly. It's the psalmist reflecting on himself, having understood who God is. And the psalmist says, who can understand why I make all these mistakes? I don't understand it myself. Why did I wander off into sin? How did that happen? It's good to reflect on some of these things. So the psalmist then goes on to say, cleanse me from secret faults, the ones I didn't even know I did. Cleanse me from secret faults, the ones that are hidden and not shown also. And keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. To conclude, we will have our last song. We're going to have to sing after this. You've been so good sitting and listening and I, I, I hope you've been receiving and, and thinking and being challenged. We must never presume on God. But we can, we should, and we must stand on God's promises when Helena was studying theology in a Catholic seminary in Salisbury, she told everyone she knew that she was saved and she was going to heaven. 
and she got labeled with the sin of presumption. No one knows who will make it except God. Okay? And I've already shown you there will be those who think they're going to make it and they've done this and that and that in, Jesus, in his name and they, and they don't make it. But is it right that actually we can't presume on God for anything? Well, I want to end with this. Okay? And the promises are up on our screen now. Our faith is based on God's promises, not presumption. And God promises in his word, for example, there are many of them, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 8, 16, there are many that we could have chosen. The spirit, this is an important one, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Do you know, when we know that we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, it is not presumption for us to say we are saved and going to heaven. We stand on God's promises. We stand on the witness of God's Holy Spirit that is within us. And we, like Abraham, we can believe that this is going to happen. It is not presumption. It's in God's word and we're standing on the promises of God and we're believing it. Therefore, I do presume that I'm going to go to heaven. I do presume I'm going to have a a perfectly functioning brand new body. Do you know also on top of this thing with the bike, the thing with the car up and the this and this, I've cracked a tooth and half a tooth has come out. I mean, can you believe it? Oh God, you know, why, why now? Is God has taken me on a journey and taught me an awful lot and I've got a lot of work to do. So when we've given our lives to Jesus, it's not presumptuous to say, I know in my Noah, I stand on the word of God. I know in my Noah, God's spirit witnesses with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Do you know, we must all be, be, beware presumptuous sins. They're so easy to fall into them. But we must learn more about God's promises, have more of an attitude of waiting on the Lord and standing on his promises. And all of those things, they go against my natural character, which God has given me. It's so easy to blame God for everything, isn't it? But I have much work to do. And I suspect that some of you might have a little bit of work to do as well. And hopefully you've got quite a little bit to think about and to study from this sermon. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Marcia.